Welcome and nice of you to join me here at Black Lodge Publishing on our YouTube channel. Tonight's talk is the first of two and in which I would like to give a very brief overview about some of my own esoteric work, especially in relation to my interests in Egyptian iconography and texts, and more specifically on how to access the duat of the netherworld. I could spend literally hours discussing the subject, so bear in mind that these talks will unfortunately only offer a short introduction to the magical work associated with scrying. For those who are more interested in the texts and commentaries themselves, please refer to my books, The Flesh of Ra and the Chamber of Darkness, published here at Black Lodge, and with the final book in the trilogy coming out very soon. So therefore, Tempest Fugit and on with the show. As a young boy, I was very interested with books, sites and artefacts concerning Egyptian concepts associated with the netherworld. I was also very lucky to have visited several Egyptian sites along with museums containing Egyptian materials, both abroad and here at home. Being schooled in Edinburgh, there is a nice collection of Egyptian archaeological and textual materials on display in the National Museum of Scotland. And on most Sundays, I would trot along to view, draw and make notes over and over again of the artefacts. However, it was not until I was studying classics and ancient history at university that several new translations of hieroglyphic texts began to appear, and with which I could then compare my own knowledge with some of the originals that I had seen. For example, many of you listening will no doubt be familiar and possibly even possess some of the early Egyptian classics, such as those of Wallace Budge's uh, Learning Hieroglyphics, his translation of the Papyri of Ani, uh, the Book of the Dead, otherwise the Book of Coming Forth by Day, also his Gods of the Egyptians, Egyptian Magic, his two volumes on Osiris, and his wonderful but early translations of the Netherworld texts. These, along with many of his articles and books, are now well over a hundred years old. And today, hieroglyphic translation methodologies have developed significantly. Although for textual work, I still refer to Sir Alan Gardner's standard Egyptian grammar. Yet there are, nonetheless, many other more up-to-date works now available for study of Egyptian glyphs and grammar. Thus. Apart from studying ancient languages, history and philosophy, I'd also been initiated. I've also read and, collect and collected a great number of academic books on alchemy, hermeticism, magic and other esoteric subjects. Yet, however, I found that for my own particular interests, one of the most important and more interesting of esoteric authors was Kenneth Grant. Obviously, Kenneth and his wife, Steffi, were not alone in their interest in the magical current, for as we know from ancient sources, late Rosicrucianism, Masonic, Golden Dawn, AA, AMORC, OTO, OT, FOI, and other 20th century occult and esoteric organisations, it was Egypt that had provided them with a nexus of iconography and text around which such organisations structured their degrees, magical teachings and training. Although more importantly, these texts showed that a revival of deep theosophy concerning the mind, soul and body was therefore, from an Egyptian perspective, a very useful avenue for further esoteric creativity. However, it was from Grant's work, who had above all managed to unify both Eastern and Western materials and by fusing these traditions would give rise to his nightside narratives and these, which he rooted in the Dark Dynasty's otherwise pre-dynastic Egypt and in linking the origins of the Ophidian or Typhonian current and which would weave its way throughout most of my own esoteric studies and indeed magical work. Therefore, the evidence and tools I used to write my own two Typhonian-inspired Egyptian works, The Flesh of Ra and Chamber of Darkness, were found on pre-dynastic iconography, that is the 
earliest uh, rock carvings and pottery, ancient Nubian Egyptian astrosophical magic, dating at least to 6,500 to 3,000 BC, along with the pre-dynastic assemblages from Nabta Playa, Hyrican Polis, and pottery from the Kada 1 to 3. The later hieroglyphs and iconography from the pyramid texts, coffin texts, also along with various other netherworld texts and later papyri, monuments and other miscellaneous objects were also used in composing both books. So the earliest hieroglyphic texts are those of the pyramid texts. For my own study, these detail the stages of transformation, especially in that of the individual's akba, the mind and the soul, and the cat body. And it is in the duat where, if they are found to be just and true, as mahat, they could be transformed into a glorious star. In these early texts, transportation was by way of ladder, or that of creating a perfect vessel, much in the same way that we can magically construct a boat or a protective egg in order that we can use to scry. Its function is therefore to carry the conscious awareness of the Akba, the mind-soul, firstly through the chamber of darkness and into the duatic netherworld by way of the Shetit, that is otherwise the beyond. From the coffin texts, we can discover more details concerning the tradition that not only inspired the night side, uh, the night side work, uh, but also the creation of the corporeal cosmos in Nehi or linear time. That is, from out of Zeptepi first time and that of a non-linear nexus represented by the chaotic energia within Nun or the chaotic energies within Nun. The coffin texts show a deep search for immortality and where there is a heavy use of Heka, magic. The key players in this pre-cosmic dance or perichoresis are therefore found rooted in the original chaotic waters of Nun and where it is Apep who lies coiled together with a tomb along with the binding dunamis power, otherwise that of Heka, that is our magical current. Therefore at the heart of this chaos lies an ophidian coiled possibility. In Hermeticism we refer uh, this to the mind of sovereignty, the authentias nous, the original mind, and from whose action has created a reflexive, or even reflective, noesis, thinking on itself. What we can term noumena, that is, incorporeal forms, and from out of which are then created corporeal phenomena. From this first moment, Zeptepi, first time, to Nehi time, that is, from incorporeality to corporeality, the corporeal is focused and expressed as the first mound of earth, the Ben Ben stone, and where Shu, air, and Tefnut, moisture, will arise, and where both the creative silt and the Nile reflect the stars and the heavens above. This is also reflected in the geometry of the point in the circle. The importance of this magical and creative current is never far away from the sources, for as we find in the coffin texts from the first intermediate period to Middle Kingdom, it's roughly around about 2000 to 1000 BC, spell 261, we discover that it is Heka who states, to me belonged the cosmos before you gods and had come into being. You have come afterwards because I am Heka. Also note from the, the later Book of the Dead, the New Kingdom, that it is Heka that exists before Zeptepi, before first time. I am one with Atum, when he still floated alone in Nun, the waters of chaos, before any of his strength had gone into creating the cosmos. I am Atum, that is most inexhaustible the potency and potential of all that is to be. This is my magic protection, and it is older and greater than all the gods together. Thus, in any esoteric work, it is the current that must be activated by invoking Heka. It is therefore a prerequisite, if one wills or wishes to make any conscious journey, 
into the hours of the duat. The Book of the Dead is basically an initiatory guide to be used for the magical instruction of the practitioners at Kaba, the mind, soul and the cat of the body. Knowledge of the book prepares the individuals for a test. It is therefore through formal study and praxis that one must learn to use it. Like the Duatic Netherworld books such as the Amduat and the Book of Gates, we begin to see the importance of what we refer to as the alchemical lake of fire. This is a place not only of regeneration for Ra and his blessed followers, including those who are scrying, and to whom it provides the nourishment and cool water, but it also is a place of destruction, especially for those who are damned. Also important in our personalised nightly subconscious dream journey, or indeed in scrying, the fifth and sixth hour of the Amduat or the Book of Gates, are the well-known 42 negative confessions that we make, meet in chapter 125b of the Book of the Dead. This culminates in the famous weighing of the deceased's ab, their heart, illustrated in many papyri from the Book of Coming Forth by Day, or Book of the Dead. An important aspect to any magician's work is in that they must originally learn the function of their own apprenticeship and where certain guilds offer praxis, for indeed it is not only through thinking but also through the hands that make structures and magic objects. These will become symbolic metaphors that provide a direct bond between the body, the corporeal, the chat, and the incorporeal, ach and ba. Thus, any cult or sacred eidolon, an image, which is manufactured and which is then used in magic through praxis, it is through the performance of ritual that totemic life is imbued into the physical object itself, and from the whole process of the rite and its outcome that knowledge is gained by the practitioner and then should be recorded. Um, in Egyptian, these are demonstrated through the magical significance of the glyphs and iconography that are written down themselves. For these are indeed the matrix in which the magical symbiosis of form and object are brought together. This is, however, a two-way process that involves both subject and object becoming one, much like that practice through single-point meditation. The student should now be aware that it is by word and deed that magic is performed, and hence we find in the manufacture of the sentient symbols, i.e. glyphs, hieroglyphs, that it is Seshat and Thoth who feature heavily in the production of bringing objects to life. That is, through Heka, through magic. Therefore, my fascination and understanding of researching the iconographic and glyphic evidence led me directly to undertaking the magic and scrying praxis in the chambers of the night side. Luckily, there is an excellent example of the text of the Amduat and the Book of Gates, and which can be seen in the John Soane's Museum in London, and for a while it became one of my favourite sources for study. It is the sarcophagi of Seti I, the New Kingdom, 1279 BC, and which should be used along with the evidence on the walls of tomb KV-17 at Luxor. Well worth a visit. Also available through virtual plans, which can be found online. My own practical aim was in magically recreating the Mechen serpent bark, in which could be used as a protective shell or veil and wherein the akba, like the seed within an egg, could be alchemically nurtured in order to attain a higher level of consciousness. That is, while scrying. And thus, not unlike at death as a star, one masters life and death by being gloriously reborn anew through gnosis of those things that one learns. This can also be seen in the alchemical process in attaining perfection and condensation of consciousness through the subconscious level. Therefore, one soon learns that unification in the night side prevents any direct dissolution of consciousness, and that in studying and practicing magic and alchemy, we can find exemplars of how the Ak 
mind, ba, soul conjoins with one, the renewal of the cat body every night, hopefully, two, for the deceased, considering the outcome after the weighing of an individual's abhat glyft as the order of mahat versus isfet or chaos, and three, how the mechen serpent bark can be used for directly scrying the nightside tunnels in the duatic netherworld and further into the shetet or the beyond. So whether you work on alchemy, magic, art, music, or in fact any form of creative process, one must begin to invoke that magical state by engaging that interstitial or liminal portal of in-betweenness. It is by entering through this liminal portal that will allow access both ways to and fro, and this I have found is central to the original sources concerning the duat in it that provide the earliest iconographic, topographic, and indeed textual presentations and discussions of how one can invoke the stages necessarily, necessary for scrying and journey into the night side. In Egypt, the most important part of a student's training as a sonyu, that is a magician, seer and healer, was therefore undertaken in Hutank, the mansion of life, where in Perank, the house of life, and once initiated as an apprentice into the scribal arts of Thoth and Seshat, and after being taught how to manipulate glyphs as sentient symbols with which compare sigils, initiates were then permitted to enter at Heki, the chamber of darkness, and then, by invoking the necessary protective formula, they could scry and explore the twelve hours and chambers of the duat by moving into the Shetit, otherwise the beyond. After which, on returning, they were subsequently tested on their knowledge by the master magician, as he who loves wisdom, and who was the living initiatic representative of the god Thoth. As I'm sure you will now be aware that central to all of this was the teaching of the scribal arts and in the learning undertaken from a close magical study of the iconography and glyphs from more ancient source works contained in the outer room of Perank, the house of life, almost like a library. These texts provided direct access to knowledge about the atavisms, Neteru and Daimonia, which the scryer uh, could encounter whilst engaged in at Keki, in the darkness, chamber of darkness, and the shit at the beyond. Thus, and uh, as I hope you will agree, that all of these entities are important and deep-rooted parts of our ancient ancestral memory structure, and as such, they form the roots of our subconscious. For this reason, the atavisms are therefore depicted zoomorphically, theriomorphically, but more frequently they represent a human or semi-anthropomorphic form with human bodies and heads of other animals, sometimes considered malevolent, but those dunames, those energies and powers that are considered benevolent, can be useful when magically invoked in order to protect the seer or scryer whilst engaged in the praxis. Many thanks from Black Lodge Publishing for listening to part one, and I hope you will subscribe to our other talks on YouTube. Hope to see you soon for part two. Thanks. <laughs>